Good morning and welcome. My name is Reverend Kate Wilkinson and I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning that you came inside today. I know that was a big sacrifice. Um, also loved the mother-daughter duo on the prelude and Ashokan Farewell is one of my favorites. Oh. Happy Mother's Day. Are there any mothers here today? Stand up mothers. We honor you today. Our prayer this morning is by Amy Young. To those who gave birth this year, we celebrate with you. To those who have lost a child, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who have experienced loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this any harder than it is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment heartache, and distance with your children. We sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. And we particularly lift up Wave this morning who lost his mother this week. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who long to be mothering your own children but aren't, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you longed for it to be. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren when that dream is not to be, we grieve with you. To those who will have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who place children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. We remember you. Amen. Our reading this morning is one of my favorites. I know I've shared it with you before. It comes from The Velveteen Rabbit by Marjorie Williams. What is real? asked the rabbit one day. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and a stick out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. 
Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, and your eyes drop out, and you get loose joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. Leading up to Mother's Day, I've been thinking about sayings that can probably be attributed to mothers, invented by mothers. I know I've heard them come out of my mother's mouth anyway. Pick up your room. Close the door. Were you raised in a barn? No, just kidding. Those weren't the types of sayings I was thinking of. I was thinking about what mothers often teach their children about character, and particularly about beauty. How many of your mothers ever warned you that beauty is only skin deep? And how many of your mothers gave the seemingly contrary but really pretty similar advice that beauty is as beauty does? Both sayings are getting at the same thing, that real beauty, true beauty, is on the inside, that it's one's inner beauty that counts in the end. Here is where our mothers and David Brooks, the New York Times op-ed columnist, are in total agreement. David recently wrote about the experience of meeting people who radiate inner light. These people can be in any walk of life, he says, and it's hard to put a finger on what exactly causes that radiance. But they seem deeply good. They listen well. They make you feel funny and valued. You often catch them looking after other people, and as they do so, their laugh is musical and their manner is infused with gratitude. They are not thinking about what wonderful work they are doing. They are not thinking about themselves at all. When I meet such a person, he says, it brightens my whole day. But he also confesses that meeting such people can also cause him to feel a little sad because meeting such people reminds him that he is actually not one of them. I mean, David doesn't feel too sorry for himself. He's a pretty darn successful guy, career-wise anyway. But he doesn't feel that he's achieved that generosity of spirit that depth of character, that inner beauty. It occurred to him as he thought about this that there are two sets of virtues, the resume virtues and the eulogy virtues. The resume virtues are the skills you bring to the marketplace, the ones they ask you about on job interviews. The eulogy virtues are the ones that are talked about at your funeral, whether you were kind, brave, honest, or faithful, were you capable of deep love? And he realized that although we all seem to spend a lot of time focusing on developing the resume virtues, and it's the resume virtues that are taught in school and assessed regularly throughout our careers, it's actually the eulogy virtues that are more important. So a few years ago, David started trying to work on that elusive beauty on the inside. He got to work not on his next career goal, but on his soul. He set out to have the sort of moral adventures that produce that kind of goodness. Now, David had to get pretty real with himself in order to embark on this endeavor. You tend to grade yourself on a forgiving curve, he admits. You figure as long as you are not obviously hurting anybody and people seem to like you, you must be okay. 
It's easy to slip into a self-satisfied moral mediocrity. But in having this rather low bar for your soul, he says, you live with an unconscious boredom, separated from the deepest meaning of life and the highest moral joys. Not so for those inner light people. So how did they get that way? Were they just born radiant? David says no. Much like the skin horse, David says, you're not born that way. You become. And more importantly, we can become. Become beautiful, more beautiful on the inside. We can do so through a gradual and slow accumulation of moral and spiritual accomplishments, a sort of moral bucket list. Now I need to make an aside here. David Brooks coined this phrase, which I've used as my sermon title today, the moral bucket list. But somehow earlier this week through a church staff version of the game Telephone, the marquee outside, for a few hours, read Morality Buckets. <laughs> I got a really good laugh out of that. And now I have this vision of buckets full of morality. And I think that they would be a great tool to dump over the heads of politicians and athletes and rock stars and family members who are getting out of control. Instead of buckets of ice water, we'll dump morality buckets on them and see if that accomplishes anything. But no, it's really a moral bucket list that we're talking about today. Things to work on before you die. So what's on the bucket list? I'll share just three of David's ideas with you this morning and point you to his full article and his full book for further exploration. First up is what he calls the humility shift. This one is a little countercultural. We live in the culture of the big me, he says. The culture that wants you to broadcast a highlight reel of your life on Facebook. Have you heard of this thing called a selfie stick? It's an extendable rod that allows you to have a longer reach when trying to take pictures of yourself on your phone. I'm not making this up. This is a real thing. Perhaps our mothers didn't do us such a big favor when they told us how wonderful we are. We believed her, and now we are a bit full of ourselves. The inner light people, though, don't seem to place themselves at the center of the circle. I'm assuming they don't own selfie sticks. They are other-centered. And although they are other-centered, they know themselves well. They know their strengths, but they also know their weaknesses. They have identified what David calls their core sin, but which I would call something else, maybe their central struggle, their selfishness, their desperate need for approval, cowardice, or hard-heartedness. The inner light people are not perfect, but they know it. Number two is self-defeat. Again, I would probably call this something else. Sorry, David. His point is good, though, that the radiant people don't just stop at identifying their core struggles. They go on to do the work of tracing how their central struggle leads to poor behavior, and they work on it. They tame their anger, 
They confront their small-mindedness with worldly experiences and by building relationships above fear and across difference. They challenge tendencies towards selfishness with intentional giving. They make themselves strong in their weakest places. You know, maybe I'll write to David and suggest that he call this soul darning instead of self-defeat. You know, like darning socks, strengthening the weak places. It works for souls, too. The last example David gives that I'll share is what he calls the dependency leap. The individual, individualist worldview, he says, suggests that character is a little iron figure of willpower inside us. But people on the road to character understand that no person can achieve self-mastery on his or her own. Individual will, reason, and compassion are not strong enough to consistently defeat selfishness, pride, and self-deception. We all need redemptive assistance from outside. David says that character is defined in part by how deeply rooted you are. Have you developed deep connections that hold you up in times of challenge and push you toward the good? Are you embedded in a web of unconditional love? Do you commit yourself to tasks that can't be completed in a single lifetime? So one of the items on our moral bucket list is achieving some kind of existential sense of belonging. I love that one. For some reason, thinking about this process of working toward inner beauty and inner light brought to mind an experience from the seventh grade. Our whole class went on an overnight trip to Camp Borndale. That's not too far from here, just over the bridge. We were assigned to groups which moved throughout the camp from station to station doing activities. We went on nature walks, tackled an obstacle course, did a science project. At night, we had a talent show and then slept in bunk houses. It's the science project that comes to mind, though. It was an experiment in purifying water. We went to a nearby pond and scooped up pailfuls of water and brought them back to the camp's dining hall. Then we got into pairs, and each duo was given a sample of the dirty pond water. It had debris and algae and who knows what else floating in it. It was murky and smelly. And we were challenged to clean it up a bit. Whichever pair got their water the cleanest would win a prize. We could use any of the tools on the table, and there was tons of stuff on there. So we strained our water and passed it through tubing or soaked it up in cotton balls and then squeezed it out. We got pretty creative. Now, as I said, groups were rotating through this station. And I had gotten word through the grapevine that the key to this whole thing was not getting everything out of the water, but actually putting something into the water. The key was the pH balance. Here's a little seventh grade science lesson. Pure water has a pH of seven. Seven is seen as neutral. Solutions with a pH less than seven are called acidic. Solutions with a pH greater than seven are called basic or alkaline. Things like rain and decomposing leaves affect the pH levels of a pond. 
So a winning team would have seen the pH strips on the table and used them to test their sample. Then they would have added something to make the water more or less acidic, coming as close as possible to that magic number seven. I don't think this science experiment came to mind for me because it was a test of my moral compass. Was I going to cheat and pretend that I came up with the pH idea on my own when really my friends had told me as our groups passed each other? I didn't, by the way. No, I think my brain may have recalled this long forgotten memory because the idea of cleaning the water is linked somehow for me with this idea of working on our souls, of working on inner beauty. Mostly, I think working on inner beauty is an exercise in straining things out, filtering out ego, watering down personal weaknesses until they are less potent. But in the end, you can't do it without adding something back in, something to create balance. Friends, love, faith. It's not a surprise to me that people who radiate inner light are also people who feel held by the universe, feel embedded in a web of unconditional loves. I don't think we can truly be that extremely present person to others if we do not feel held ourselves. So how will we know when we have crossed anything off of our moral bucket list? How can we tell if there is any light emanating from our own souls? We can't be present at our own funerals. Well, maybe in spirit, but not in person. So maybe we'll never know in our living years when or if we have reached that inner beauty threshold. But David says, we will know when progress has been made. One moment when we look out at a picnic or a dinner or a valley and we are overwhelmed by a feeling of limitless gratitude. That is when we'll know we're headed in the right direction. May it be so for each of you. Amen and blessed be.